So, um, hello everybody, very nice to see you all. Uh, I'm Jeremy Levy, I'm also at Imperial with Megan. Um, and so, uh, before dinner, let's talk about members in the property, where there is a bit more data than a minimal change in FSGS, which is clearly a good thing, uh, but remains also a very difficult disease to treat and treat properly. So, uh, uh, this has been though, a transformed disease in the last five years, hasn't it? You know, we now understand much more about the ETA pathogenesis, there's loads about um, testing for the disease and what might cause it. We've known for a long time about spontaneous remissions, but we can now try and predict a bit better who might go into spontaneous remission. Um, I'll talk a bit about aggressive conservative management, not just about immunosuppressive therapies, because these are equally important. Uh, and exactly as Megan talked about with FSGS particularly, selecting the right patients to treat is really, really critical to avoid toxicity. We're going to be talking about many of the same drugs, so much less about steroids and membranes. Um, and so toxicity is always a concern. So let's cover these sort of four areas in the next 40 minutes or so. But you need to think first. Here's three cases. You need, to, you need to vote for an answer. You can't sit there anymore doing bugger all. A 55-year-old man presented with nephrotic syndrome, 3 half grams a day, PCR of day 350, and he's had a biopsy and he's got membranous. His creatinine's 100 micromoles per litre, and after three months of Ramipril, so he's had Ramipril, 10 milligrams a day, big dose, his urine protein creatinine ratio is 210. What are you going to do now? You have seen him two or three times in the three months, but he's now come back to the clinic. Are you going to give him cyclosporine or tacrolimus, the CNI? Are you going to give him the Ponticelli regime, so six months of alternating months of steroids and cyclophosphamide? Are you going to give him rituximab? Neither Megan nor I have any shares in rituximab, but it is going to feature. Or are you just going to keep going as you are and not immunosuppress him at all and say, well, bugger off, you've got a bit of proteinuria, let's keep going. Got to pick one of those four, though. Her hands up for A. B. Lots of you for B. C. One of you. D. Quite a lot of you. OK. So uh, those of you who voted for B, how many of you actually ever used it? <laughs> OK, so none of you. Anybody in the room ever tried to use the Ponticelli regime? Few of you. OK. Not because I'm opposed to it, we'll talk about it in a moment. I'll give you my answers at the end, but it's always very interesting to reflect on differences. Next one, a 55-year-old man with nephrotic syndrome. He's more nephrotic, 8 grams a day of proteinuria. Biopsy, he's got membranous. Creatinine's 100. Serum albumin's 15, so badly nephrotic. On Ramipril, a statin diuretics. How long are you going to wait before you start immunosuppressing him? Or you might never want to immunosuppress him, or ways I'd say. You're either never going to immunosuppress this man, or you're going to start treating him now because you're so worried, or you're going to wait three months, six months, or 12 months. And of course, I know there'll be other factors to think about, but pick one of these answers based on the information you've got. <laughs> Votes for A. B. Lots of you are going to start now. C. Lots of you are waiting three months. D. Few of you are waiting six months. D. E. 12 months. Few of you waiting 12 months, and clearly I know in the meantime you want some more information. This is good. That would have made a nice exam question. It split you very nicely. <laughs> a 55-year-old man presents with nephrotic syndrome. Same patient, 8 grams a day almost. Membranous biopsy, creatinine's 100, albumin's 15. His PLA to our antibody result is back, and it's 150. Normal range up to 20. This is a high level of PLA to our antibodies. Would this in any way alter your management plan? Votes for yes. Votes for no. Great. Last one, and then you'll get the answers. A 55-year-old man, he's nephrotic, he's got membranous, 8 grams a day, creatinine's 160. He's treated for four months with an ACE, his creatinine's 170, albumin remains low, 19, his PCR's 650. Okay, so he's had four months of treatment conservatively. What are you going to do now? CNI, Ponticelli, rituximab, or keep going as you are now. These are all common scenarios. So votes for A. A couple of you. B. Lots of you. C. Few of you. D. Few of you want to just let him rot and get... Renal fake? No, no, no. 
I'm, that was not fair. This is the disease we're talking about, isn't it? Membranous. You all know what it looks like. This is a biopsy, an H&E, a PAS, and a silver stain. These are very high pad views, beautiful spikes on the outside of the capillary loop in the glomerulus. We're talking about a disease with electron-dense deposits on the outside of capillary membranes. There's the electron microscopy. Sub-epithelial deposits. We've known this for 60 years. Immuno, this is IgG with granular deposition of IgG and C3 on the outside of the capillary loops. So this is a disease we've known for many, many years, has bloody great immune deposits all the way around the capillary loops. But for many years, we didn't know why people got immune deposits, though we've had an animal model since the 1960s called Heyman nephritis, which could do exactly the same thing, which we could show as an autoimmune disease. And until the last seven-ish years, we just said most people had idiopathic disease. There are a whole series of secondary causes, most of which are rare. And of course, we don't use gold at all anymore, so you're never going to see that anymore. But there are secondary causes, and it is very important, and we'll come back to cancer in a moment, but there are secondary causes that you absolutely need to look for. But having looked for them, most patients were labelled as idiopathic. And what's changed, of course, was the discovery, about seven years ago now, of antibodies to the phospholipase A2 receptor, which have been shown to be very strongly associated with membranous nephropathy. And undoubtedly, these are the cause. And in the last five years, we've had this amazing explosion of information of several other antibodies recognizing extracellular transmembrane proteins in the kidney that are associated and almost certainly causal for membranous nephropathy. Um, and the list is sort of growing. This PLA2R antibodies are the commonest, and most of us now can routinely test for these in our labs. Um, and this was, I'm not going to show you all the data, but the data is beautiful. This was the original data from Beck showing Western blots, showing patients with membranes having an antibody in their blood that recognizes the PLA2R receptor, whereas patients with diabetes and FSGS don't. And this was just the very first set of data from the original New England Journal paper uh, that showed patients with idiopathic membranous, very significant number, 70% of them had antibodies, whereas secondary membranous, some patients did, but only about 20%. Okay? Um, and the uh, normals and others, nobody at all ever had antibodies. And if you do immunohistology, it's a single glomerulus, the red is the PLA2R. You can see staining of antibodies bound to PLA2R antibodies here on the outside of capillary loops. So there's an antibody in your blood in most patients to the phospholipase A2 receptor, and it's bound in the kidney. There's been loads of data since then from loads of countries in loads of series showing the same thing. This is idiopathic membranous and showing about almost 90% of patients having antibodies in their blood. But when they're in remission, the antibodies have mostly gone away. And this is secondary lupus, hep B, and cancer associated. Lupus and hep B, very few patients with antibodies. Cancer associated, 20 to 30% do have antibodies. And since 2011, basically every registrar in every unit around the world gets an abstract by looking at their series of patients and antibody profiles, and it's been the same data worldwide. So we'll come back to the end. We're almost moving to a place, do you need a biopsy if you've got an antibody in your blood to prove you've got membranous? The false positive rate for other kidney diseases seems to be near zero. It is not found in other kidney diseases. So that was the one explosion of interest. You have an antibody in the blood that's very strongly associated with membranous. And then this beautiful paper came out in 2011 looking at genetic associations. This is a huge multinational GWAS genome-wide association study of single nucleotide polymorphisms in membranous. And there are only two associations with membranous. And isn't it exciting that one of them is the PLA2R receptor? So single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms associated with the receptor are associated with disease, and the other was a single HLA type. Now, in this original data, which came out in 2011, it was DQA1. Actually, more recently, it may not be quite DQ, but it, there is an HLA association. And this fits beautifully with an autoimmune phenotype. Most patients will have a specific HLA pattern, uh, protein, uh, haplotype that allows presumably presentation of antigens. But what's been very interesting is since this paper, it's been impossible to show any particular mutations or changes in the HLA, uh, in the phospholipase A2 receptor in patients with membranous versus those without. So this is a genetic association, but it's been hard to show actually in practice how that causes disease. 
but this is now the hypothesis. And if you carry the HLA-DQA1 haplotype and one of the SNPs associated with the disease PLA2R antigen, your risk for membranous goes up 80-fold. So it's a very, very strong association. So you have an appropriate genotype, there's the target protein, and that seems to lead to membranous nephropathy. So we've now understood this in a way we really did not understand six or seven years ago. And if you're thinking about the way the disease progresses, this is what you might think. Something clearly triggers why you develop antibodies at any one point in time. You develop phospholipase A2 receptor antibodies. That leads to membranous nephropathy and proteinuria. For whatever reason, either with treatment or spontaneously, your antibodies disappear. And clearly, at some point later, your proteinuria goes away as your kidney remodels itself and those deposits go away. So you will always see a lag between disappearance of antibodies and remission of proteinuria if you can achieve, or it occurs spontaneously, loss of antibodies. And that's just a, and this time scale is an arbitrary time scale, a cartoon for how we might understand the disease. But you would never expect proteinuria to go away at the same time as antibodies because clearly your kidney, those deposits have actually got to disappear and remodel. And just here's one example. Again, it's the Beck group looking at this. And this is a group of patients who did deplete their antibodies with rituximab. This is what happened with their anti pla 2 antibodies. With treatment, they disappeared. You can see it comes time, takes 9 to 12 months to fully go. And this is proteinuria. So at 12 months, these patients are still very proteinuric. They've got 5 grams a day. It's come down from 12 grams a day. But of course, this continues to go down and down and down subsequently. So antibody removal, antibody loss is subsequently associated with remission of disease, which we'll come back to a bit later. And in terms of antibodies and prediction of outcomes, this is important. Again, lots of data. This is just one bit of data. Patients with high titer antibodies are much, much more likely to not go into remission spontaneously or to have a poor outcome. This is disease-free survival. And patients with low or medium level, and this is arbitrary division, but basically low level antibodies, much more likely to do better than patients with high levels of antibodies. <coughs> there are other antibodies. So this is the other one you should remember. It's got a completely impossible name that I can never remember anyway. The thrombospondin type 1 domain containing 7A antigen, THS7DA. But there have now been increasing reports of this as an autoantigen in membranous. And in the UK, most hospitals can't do this, but Manchester will do this assay for you. And this was one patient who got recurrent membranous after a transplant with beautiful deposition of this antibody in the kidney. So the THS7D, THS7DA antigen, some patients, much smaller numbers than with uh, PLA2R. And then there have been others. So there's one case report of a baby developing membranous when they had endopeptidase antibodies. So what we're seeing is a number of different antibodies binding to glomerular antigens that might lead to membranous evolving, um, and the most common being PLA2R. Last bit on the uh, ECA pathogenesis. So this is very sensitive and very, very specific for membranous more than almost any other antibody assay. There is a correlation with outcomes and disease activity, but not always with proteinuria, and there's a strong correlation with recurrence of membranous post-transplantation. And in one big registry, the Swedish registry, patients who, only 9% of patients with an antibody ever developed a malignancy, but those who had membranous and didn't have antibodies have a much higher rate of subsequent cancer, meaning this association with negative antibody disease and a secondary cause being useful. So if you've got membranous and you don't have antibodies, look hard for a secondary cause. So let's think about treatment. And these are, again, a bit like Megan, four really critical questions. Should we immunosuppress everybody? It's an antibody-mediated disease. Surely we should give them all antibody-depleting therapies. Should we treat the non-nephrotic patients? Okay, what about those with normal kidney function nephrosis? And what about those with declining renal function nephrosis? So four big sorts of groups of patients. So let's quickly tackle those. Those are the common problems we face. Exactly like Megan suggested, for every kidney disease, the worse your proteinuria, the worse your outcome. And persistent heavy proteinuria in membranous predicts end-stage kidney disease. 
But you're not talking about next year, you're talking 10 or 15 years down the line. If you're only in a hospital for two years, you'll never see that. So it's about long-term follow-up. As with all kidney diseases, if you presented with abnormal creatinine at presentation, you do badly. And as with every kidney disease, even partial remissions are massively beneficial to patients. And I'll show you almost exactly the same graph that Megan just showed you. It's for the CATRAN Toronto, Toronto Registry. We could have changed this from membranous to FSGS. It's exactly the same. No remissions at 15 years, 70% of people on dialysis. Complete remission, nobody on dialysis. Partial remission, 20%. Massive benefit of a partial remission, but complete remission is better. And if you leave these people nephrotic, they will end up on dialysis. But it takes 15 years. So you need to get proteinuria away, or it needs to go away on its own. So this is the sorts of range of immunosuppressive treatments. You might think about no immunosuppression to a range of other drugs, which we'll cover briefly. And there's the same K-Dagger supplements. There's a Cochrane Collaboration Review of Immunosuppression. These are now massively out of date, aren't they? The data that fed the K-Dagger Review stopped in 2010, seven years ago. There is an update planned. It won't come out in 2019, I don't think. Uh, and there's been quite a lot of data since then. So first point to remember is this. What happens if you don't treat at all? This is 100 patients who were never treated. And at five years, 30% are in complete remission with no treatment. At one year, it's only about 8% in complete remission, but it's another 20% who get a partial remission. And those numbers increase over time. So spontaneous remissions do occur in membranous up to about 30% within actually about two years when you're getting about 30% spontaneous remissions. In different series, it ranges from 5 to about 30%. But you need to be aware of that, because why poison somebody with immunosuppression if they're going to get a spontaneous remission? So if we could identify these patients, it would be really helpful. And then this Spanish data is really fascinating. It's 300 patients, and it's also looking at spontaneous remissions. They also saw 32% of patients getting spontaneous remissions, and the mean time was over a year. So if you're waiting three months to see a spontaneous remission, you will miss it in lots of people. You haven't waited long enough. People get very worried that the most nephrotic will never remit spontaneously. In this series, patients even with more than 12 grams a day, sorry, of proteinuria, got spontaneous remissions. A very heavy nephrosis. The best predictor was if you'd reduced your proteinuria more than 50% within the first year, you're going to go further and get spontaneous remission. If not complete, certainly a good partial remission. But that's already waiting a year. So spontaneous remissions are really important, and then you have to decide how long you're going to wait before you decide it isn't happening. Waiting does not mean doing nothing. And exactly as Megan alluded to, conservative management is really important in FSGS, in membranous, and we don't do it very well. Get your nurses to do it. They will do it much better than you will. You need to get people onto maximum doses of ACE inhibitors quickly. You need to talk to them about low salt diet. In England, we do this terribly. The French do it really well. Probably their bread tastes bad anyway, or Italy's bad, particularly bad. Low salt diets, anticoagulation, exactly as Megan's talked about. ACE to maximum dose. If their potassiums are fine, you might want to add an ACE to an ARB for proteinuria. These are not diabetics with terrible kidneys. If they can't have that, think about diltiazem and verapamil, which are anti-proteinuric. Amlodipine does not reduce your proteinuria. So if you're trying to control proteinuria, think about the non dihydropyridine custom antagonist. And all of this lot, again, we're less good at dealing with. There's a very good data that people who continue to smoke, the effect on proteinuria of ACE inhibitors is less than half that on those who stop smoking, for example. So this is not trivial. Very important. Try and get it done maximally. Other good prognostic factors, being younger, having less proteinuria, and being female are good prognostic factors. 
there are some very, very subtle pathological changes. If all the immune deposits look the same sort of age, they're homogenous, so again, a better prognosis, probably because it indicates a single hit led to your antibody, led to your disease. And not surprisingly, scarring is a poor outcome. What a surprise. And we've already said that low-level antibodies are more likely to disappear on their own, and if you're already watching antibody levels declining, patients more likely to go into spontaneous remission. So no, you're not using this just as a diagnostic test. Repeated measurements of PLA2R antibodies are useful prognostically. What about non-nephrotic patients? There is good data from Toronto. They do fine. Very rarely people become nephrotic, and if they do, it is always in the first year. So if your patient's got a PCR of 150 and a biopsy showing membranous, they're very unlikely to lose much kidney function uh, compared to nephrotics, and they don't need immunosuppressing. So what about steroids? And this is easy. There is no place for steroids in membranous nephropathy. There were three very large trials, all done 40 years ago. They all showed no benefit. This is one of them, steroids and placebo. There is no difference. So steroids alone do not work. This was huge doses. 60 mg per day for two months, not huge, but moderately high doses, did not help. Don't give steroids alone for membranous nephropathy. So how about steroids and something else? Well, you could argue, why did people use steroids? But all these trials were done back in the 1980s. So this is really the very best data so far, and yet none of us do it, or very rarely. These are the Ponticelli trials, beautiful studies. They all enrolled about 100, 130 patients. They were all done in the late 80s. There is 10 years of follow-up data. The original trials used chlorambucil, but because nephrologists don't, aren't used to using this drug, they then switched to oral cyclophosphamide, and the data is the same. The critical thing about these trials, it's biopsy-proven membranous, nephrotic patients with normal serum creatinines. These are patients with normal kidney function. This is the really complicated regime for those of you who don't know it. Month one, you give three days of methylprednisolone injections, a gram. Day one, day two, day three. So your patient goes home, comes in, goes home, comes in, goes home, comes in for an injection. The rest of month one, they get 30 mg, half a mg per kilogram per day of oral steroids every day. So let's say 30 mg of pred for the rest of month one. At the end of month one, they just swap. No tailing of steroids, stop the steroids, throw them away, start cyclophosphamide. Two mg per kilogram per day for one month. Month three, go back to steroids with your first three days of methylprednisolone. It is a nightmare to give it, isn't it? Basically, your patients have got to come every week for six months because you can't make it work. You can usually get away with every two weeks, but you need to see them at the transition. You've got to get it right. They've got to come for their three days of methylpred. It is just a nightmare. If you want to make it work, download from the University of Birmingham Hospital website a very, very good patient information sheet, which has it all written out. You give to the patients. It allows you to make it work. It's the best patient sheet and helping you. But it is a complete nightmare, isn't it? But it works. The first trial showed that 80% of patients went into remission versus 30% in the control group. That was remission from nephrotic syndrome. What happened after this was the first data, Ponticelli 1998. Complete remissions at two years, about 20%. Partial remissions, about 70%. Total remissions at five years hit almost 90%. This is remission from nephrotic syndrome. It is a very effective treatment. Did it help protect kidney function? Yes. This is the 10-year data. The control group, 40% had hit dialysis in 10 years. The treated group, only 8%. This is a massively significant benefit. This regime keeps you off the... All these patients had normal creatinine at the beginning. Natural history, no treatment, dialysis after 10 years. So this treatment works. This is the problem. Ponticelli reports 9% severe side effects, one patient getting diabetes. They're all Italians, they're all North Italians. Maybe that's the issue, maybe he lies, wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> this, this is going to be an unusable film, isn't it, for the Renal Association website? Uh, of course he doesn't. 
maybe just doesn't report all the side effects. This was what the Scottish reported using the Ponticelli regime. 82% of patients get side effects with this regime. That's what most of us would see. And Megan's already shown you the sort of side effects. Osteonecrosis, diabetes, obesity, getting fat. It's so much steroids. The Indians really brilliantly just copied the trial. Because what most of you do is you say, well, you don't quite like that regime. It's a lot of steroids. You'll tinker with it. You'll give a bit less steroids. You'll give a bit less cycle. That's the regime that worked. So they repeat it in India, report it 10 years ago. The same data works beautifully in an Indian population. 73% <laughs> in complete or partial remission versus 35% controls. 10-year dialysis. Well, these are almost identical. Look at those figures. Identical. Survival without death or dialysis, much better with treatment. They measured quality of life. It was better with treatment, despite many more side effects with treatment, because your nephrotic syndrome got better. And nephrotic syndrome makes your quality of life poor. Almost the same survival graphs, but look how long it takes before you can show problems. It takes 10 years. But all of that data, this regime worked in Italy, it works in India, it works. So the Dutch said, well, we don't really quite like that regime, it's difficult. And they changed it. They gave the same steroids, bizarrely. Loads of methylpred, loads of steroids, but they gave oral cyclophosphamide, two mg per kilogram day, for a whole year. Now, most renal units would have said, I'm going nowhere near cyclophosphamide for a whole year at two mg per kilogram per day. It's a lot of cyclophosphamide. But that's what they did in Nymogen, and they've beautifully reported loads of follow-up. So first of all, they showed it works. Lots of remission from nephrotic syndrome. Some complete, some partial. And then they showed lots of very good outcomes in terms of renal survival. This is not controlled trial data. But what they then showed is huge toxicity, big effect of side effect regime. And then they compared their outcomes in white versus the rest of Holland. So white is this regime. The rest of Holland didn't touch it with the barge pole. And what they've showed in Nymogen is they've got almost nobody hitting dialysis with membranous. So the most recent cohort, less than 10% of their population ever hit dialysis, whereas the rest of Holland, up to 60%. So this isn't a controlled trial, but this regime stops you getting onto dialysis and gets you into remission, but is really toxic. So this is the problem. We've got two regimes that work, but have lots of side effects. So these regimes work, but are very, very toxic. Should we use them? So, you, of course, you can have this discussion with your patients, but in the end, the patient will say to you, what do you think? And you need to have a strong view. But they are the only proven treatments that preserve kidney function. So, let me show you the bits of the other data. What about cyclosporin and tacrolimus? So, this all started again in North America in 2001. This was the original cyclosporin data in patients who had failed the steroids because they'd been in the trials for steroids. These all have normal kidney function. Look, creatinines of 95, heavy proteinuria, nephrotic. And they aimed for trough levels about 150 with cyclosporin. It works for nephrotic syndrome. Complete and partial remissions, cyclosporin, 40%, placebo, 13%. That's at six months, 40%, okay? Complete and partial remissions at six months. So that was the final data, 75%. So cyclosporine gets you into remission from your nephrosis, but this is short-term data. Again, 10 years old data now, but tacrolimus in Spain. It's a randomized controlled trial of tacrolimus versus no tacrolimus. Normal kidney function, heavy proteinuria, all on ACEs and ARBs. At 18 months, 94% in complete or partial remission with tacrolimus. It gets you into remission there is no long-term data on kidney function. And that was the probability of 18 months of complete or partial remission with tacrolimus near 100% versus placebo. Tacrolimus is great. It gets you into remission. And this, again, the same data. So there's the 18-month data. 90-odd percent, complete remissions, partial remissions. That's the control group. So they stopped the tacrolimus at 18 months. Of course you would. And that's what happened six months later. Sorry, 16 months later. 
lots of relapses, exactly as Megan showed you with FSGS and minimal change. So these treatments get you into remission, but when you stop the tacrolimus, about half your patients will relapse. But this is not a toxic regime, exactly as Megan showed you. Side effect profile is very good for tacrolimus. And there are a few other studies. This is again a Chinese study reported four years ago. Normal kidney function, heavy proteinuria. This was oral cyclophosphamide versus tacrolimus um, and a slightly unusual regime, but basically the same data. Remissions of tacrolimus 85% and cyclophosphamide 65%. So they compared tacrolimus with cyclophosphamide and had very similar outcomes for nephrosis. So tacrolimus gets you into remission very well. Very few side effects, but when you stop it, high relapse rates. There is some interesting data, again, all from China, saying if you wean tacrolimus to very low levels, half a milligram twice a day, so almost undetectable blood levels, and maintain that for another two years, you avoid relapses. But it hasn't been repeated anywhere else. And then this trial came out four years ago, which was the UK's first attempt at a big GN trial that took Peter Madsen 10 years to accumulate 100 patients, very sadly, and we've got much better with people like Megan's leadership since then at getting trials done. 108 patients, 10 years to recruit. But this was patients not with normal kidney function. They had declining kidney function and nephrotic. Very important difference. And they were either given cyclosporin, the Ponticelli regime, or placebo, ACEs and ARBs. And the end point wasn't remission of nephrosis. It was, did your kidneys continue to decline functionally? So it's a very important question, very different from the original Ponticelli trials. But you had to have lost 20% of kidney function to get into the trial. It's not normal kidney function. And what this trial showed was that the Ponticelli regime worked in this group very well. Well, not very well, moderately well. This is three years. But placebo or cyclosporine had no effect on declining kidney function. And cyclosporine was of no benefit on top of ACEs and ARBs. So in a patient with declining kidney function, a CNI does not seem to help on the basis of this one trial, which is a good trial. MMF, it's very easy. There are some small studies, and this one, it's not a big study, it's only 36 patients, but it's a randomized controlled trial, and basically shows no benefit in membranous of MMF. There are case series of some benefit, this trial shows no benefit. Equal numbers of complete and partial remissions in those given MMF or placebo. No benefit in membranous of MMF. We've all seen cases where it helps, but in this trial, no benefit. <coughs> so, MMF, probably no benefit when you stop at high relapse rates. We've got to talk about rituximab. And rituximab has transformed the scene, and the challenge we've got now in 2018 is no long-term data but really interesting short-term data. Almost like Megan talked about with minimal change. Five years ago, Riganetti and the North Italians and Ramuzzi managed to get 100 consecutive patients treated with rituximab with biopsy-proven membranous. Depressingly, they did not run it as a trial. So it's a cohort. Reasonably normal creatinines, heavily nephrotic, often long-term. They initially gave four doses of rituximab, but halfway through, they found that most patients responded after one dose, and they shifted and only gave people one dose of rituximab. And they found that of the 100 patients, just over 50% had a complete or partial remission at about two years. And it takes about seven months to go into a remission. And they had essentially no serious adverse events. So this was the first big cohort reported five years ago. Effective, 50% of patients going into remission. I mean, that's not 100%, but it's still pretty good. Um, and they didn't see very much problems. But again, starting to get a hint of relapses, presumably when you get B-cell reconstitution. No long-term follow-up yet. And this was just their data overall of remissions and complete and partial remissions. So showing what I've just shown you already. But this is based on antibody titer because subsequently they were able to man manage the antibodies. So they went back and looked at their antibodies and look at the difference in remissions. Big, big difference. 
So this was the frequency of the progression. If you've got your lowest antibody titers, you do best, which I've already told you. And then in the last one year, these two trials have both reported. So this is the one trial called the GEMRITUX trial, which was a randomized controlled trial of rituximab versus maximum ACE and ARB, conservative management. And I'm only going to show you one bit of data from it. Again, it's from the Italian group now, reported last year. This is at month three, and this is at month six, and this is antibodies. So you can see very quickly with rituximab, you deplete antibodies and you reduce serum antibodies. But look, they do go away 30% of patients with just conservative treatment. So your antibodies will go in some patients just as you wait. These are the spontaneous remissions. And this is the 17-month data. And this is patients achieving a complete or partial remission. So with rituximab, just under 70% of patients get a complete or partial remission compared to 40% essentially, with ACEs and ARBs. So this again shows you that this is even people with long-standing disease, spontaneous remissions are still occurring, but you're doubling it if you give rituximab at 17 months. No data on kidney function long-term. No data about what happens beyond that as your B cells return and potentially your antibodies come back. And then the mentor trial reported last year at the ASN. And this is a depressingly terrible trial. Because they get, look, 127 probably patients in the trial really quickly, run out of the Mayo Clinic, and they set the trial up just to prove rituximab works, not to say, is this a better treatment? Because look what they've done. They've taken very well, they've taken patients with poor kidney function off them. They gave them rituximab, a single dose, and then a second dose at six months if they needed it. They gave the other group was cyclosporin, which they deliberately only gave for 12 months. And they looked at the outcomes then at 18 months. We know that half your patients will relapse at 18 months. So they set the trial up already to know that loads of their patients would relapse. At six months, 50% of the site, and you can say, why give cyclosporine in this era? Why not use tacrolimus? But anyway, they did. At six months, 50% of the cyclosporine arm had a complete or partial remission, 35% rituximab. By one year, that hadn't changed. So cyclosporine gives you quick and early remissions that doesn't improve over the next six months. But rituximab, all the remissions are going up and up and up. As the antibodies go away, presumably as your kidney remodels. At two years, rituximab has sort of stabilised. About 63% of complete or partial remissions. And this is half your patients have relapsed. But we knew that. We knew they'd relapsed. So this becomes statistically significant because they knew that the cyclosporine group would relapse. But what this does show very nicely is both these treatments work to get you into a remission. The challenge with CNIs is you're going to have to continue them. And we don't know about rituximab after two years. Will you need to continue once a year, once a, every two years? Or will these people stay in remission? We don't know. Complete remissions were only 23 of these patients. So about half are complete and half are partial remissions. But rituximab is looking really exciting. Having said that, there, sorry, this is one other report that also showed very similar things. This is a Chinese study, again, about 50% complete and partial remissions with very nephrotic patients and abnormal kidney function who'd failed previous treatment. So rituximab works in those with normal kidney function and it works in those with abnormal kidney function. Last month, there is a cohort from North Italy, I've got no slides on, where they failed to show rituximab works in 60 patients. They got complete and partial remission rates of only 15%. So we are not yet in a place to prove that rituximab works, but there is very encouraging evidence that it works for nephrosis with no data on long-term kidney function. It is much, much less toxic than Ponticelli. And published in C. Jason one, last month, was a direct comparison of the Dutch and the Italian Ponticelli and cyclophosphamide regimes with the Italian rituximab regimes for side effects and not surprisingly showing infinitely less side effects with rituximab versus, this is not a head-to-head -head comparison, it's a cohort comparison versus cyclophosphamide-based regimes. But we don't know what will happen as you stop the rituximab and whether people will remain permanently antibody depleted. So, is there a consensus? 
So one of the problems with consensus is rituximab has emerged beyond all of the published consensus statements from K. Daigo. But I'll tell you what we can say at the moment. And I just want to remind you, this is a patient we treated starting in 2014. So they presented with biopsy-proved membrane as a serum albumin of 26 and a urine PCR of 900. So some people would have said, this is bad nephrosis, start immunosuppressing straight away. So we waited, there's a blip down there, but basically urine proteinuria, that's at sort of three months, has already come down quite a lot. So we just waited on ACEs and ARBs and diuretics and a low salt diet. And this is a patient not immunosuppressed. He actually has moderately high PLA2 or antibody levels. But look at that, very nice, it takes time. Protein creatinine coming down. And the biggest clue is that early drop in proteinuria that seems to predict a good response. So don't forget, spontaneous remissions and conservative care is really important. But it's a slow process for your serum albumin to improve. So pick who you're going to immunosuppress. You only need to immunosuppress nephrotic patients, more than about four grams of their proteinuria, that does not improve during observation, probably of at least six months. <coughs> With the exception of clearly a patient who's got you know, life-threatening nephrotic syndrome, they've presented with a pulmonary embolism and a serum albumin of five, you're not going to wait six months. And you should treat people who've got declining kidney function, though we do get worried they may not respond to treatment. So heavy nephrosis, life-threatening nephrosis, declining kidney function, you should treat. You should never treat those who've got severe kidney failure, they won't get better, nor those who've got non-nephrotic proteinuria, and there is no benefit for using mycophenolate or steroid monotherapy. So that's easy. When K. Daigo reported, they said best options were either Ponticelli or um, as the best treatment for initial treatment. But you can absolutely use the Dutch regime, but it's got more toxicity. But you should wait at least six months, was what they said. And you should, after the Ponticelli regime, you should wait at least six months after you've finished it to see if people are going to get better. But this is a very toxic regime. And they said an alternative would be cyclosporine or tacrolimus for at least six months. Most people would say at least a year, and we, I would absolutely not stop at six months. <coughs> But if they've not responded at all in six months, they're not going to respond at all. You would want to have started to see reduction in proteinuria, improvement in serum albumin. Okay? So if you've got absolutely no response in six months, you can stop it. And how long to continue it? That was what they recommended. They said, you know, start to reduce after about 12 months, but you've got to give at least 12 months treatment. We'd all agree, at least 12 months treatment. Most of us would probably go for 18 months before starting to reduce. But this is likely to be added because of the UK Renal Association data. You really can't use a CNI if somebody's already got declining kidney function. It will not work. So nephrotics, you've got a choice here. Where does rituximab fit in? Well, it is much less toxic. It looks efficacious. We just don't have long-term data yet. Cochrane added just one other useful comment. It just pointed out how toxic Ponticelli is. But it also points out this is the only regime that reduces death or dialysis, but with very significant risk of side effects, which I've told you repeatedly. I'll give you a, pro, a, a, a cartoon in the end. So let's go back to those four patients. What are you going to do? Here's my 55-year-old man. He's non-nephrotic, PCRs, 3.5 grams a day. He's got membranous, sorry, he's nephrotic, membranous, creatinine 100. Three months of ram perindopril and his urine PCR has gone to 210 from 350. Some of you want a different thing, so vote now based on what we've talked about. Who's going to give him A? Nobody. B? Nobody now. C? Nobody. D? So I have fantastically persuaded you all now to get the right answer. <laughs> D is definitely the right answer. Undoubtedly, it's very rare we can say that, isn't it? But I don't think there's a nephrologist around the world who would disagree that D is the right answer. He's reduced his protein a tiny bit. He's non-nephrotic now. He just needs ongoing care. He'll probably continue to improve over the next year and end up with lower proteinuria. Doesn't need immunosuppression. Don't immunosuppress this man. But don't say you're doing nothing. You're not doing nothing. 
You're giving him ACEs and ARBs, you've monitored his bodies, you've made sure his blood pressure's down, you've encouraged him to exercise, you've encouraged him to keep off the fags. You've done all those things, that's not doing nothing. This was the man with membranous, 8 grams of proteinuria, a creatinine of 100, albumin of 15, on ACEs. How long are you going to wait before you immunosuppress him? Or you might never immunosuppress him. Now, of course, you want some more information, but that is very nephrotic and you might want to know other bits. So you've got votes for A, B, C, D and E. Voting for A, you'd, yeah, I agree, you'd have no, enough information. So B, who wants to immunosuppress him now? But now none of you. C, three months? Six months? <laughs> Twelve months? So this is a challenging one. And I said, I, 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 you want more information, don't you? So I, the, I think the best answer is between three and six months. So if, for example, his serum albumin has gone from 15 to 20, in the first three months, and his PCR has gone from 800 to 400, you could absolutely wait another three months. If his albumin is unchanged at 15, his PCR is unchanged at 800, and you've got a high PLA to our antibody, I completely agree, three months is you've not won. <coughs> but if things are starting to change, you could wait. He's not going to die from this. You need to anticoagulate him. You need to do other things. But you could wait if things are starting to improve. So C and D both get your votes. Do the PLA antibody results make a difference? And some of you said yes, no, and some of you said no. Who's going for yes now? Who's going for A? Votes for A? Some of you votes for B. So you're still a bit split, but I would say yes, it does make a difference. And it makes a difference because if he's got very high level antibodies at the beginning, <coughs> he's much less likely to go into a spontaneous remission, but also the serial monitoring. So if at three months the antibodies have gone from 120 down to 60, Actually, you've got evidence that things are starting to improve on their own. If the antibody starts at 30, that's positive but low level, again, much more likely to go into a spontaneous remission, so you would wait longer. So I think the antibodies are now helping us to define when you might start immunotherapy. And actually, in some patients avoiding a biopsy, if your patient presents with a pulmonary embolism and you anticoagulate him on day one, and then nephrotic, we used to somehow do some difficult jiggery-pokery at about three or four weeks to say, let's stop the heparin, find a window to biopsy to get a diagnosis of minimal change versus membranous versus FSGS. If you've now got a PLA2 or antibody result that's strongly positive at presentation with a pulmonary embolism and nephrosis, he's got a membranous. Don't biopsy. That's going to be a useful test. We're not yet at the stage of doing that, I don't think, for everybody, but that might emerge in the next two years. Yes, probably. Last one. So this was the patient. Eight grams of, of uh, proteinuria, creatinine of 160 on an ACE. Creatinine's gone from 160 to 170 over four months. His albumin's still 19. His PCR's bet gone from 800 to 650. So what are you going to do with this man at four months? Who's going for A, a C and I? Nobody now. B, Ponticelli. Lots of you. C, rituximab. A few of you. And D, not immunosuppress him. So some of you are not going to immunosuppress this man at all. So I've split you. So I, I'm delighted that none of you are going for A. This is a patient I do not believe you should be touching with a CNI. He will lose kidney function if you give him a CNI. And the um, a Matheson MRC, a UK renal association trial, showed those patients don't benefit. So you are left with these three choices. So the original Ponticelli was patients with normal kidney function, but the Dutch and subsequent studies have shown that this might work, but it's quite toxic. But he's lost quite, he's got quite poor kidney function, currently 170. Again, we don't have randomised controlled trials, but this is a group we've shown he'll get remission from his nephrotic syndrome with a chance of about 60% and no toxicity. In terms of D, you're saying basically he's stuffed. And I think most people would say, that, and I haven't given you a GFR, but at that level of creatinine, if his kidneys are a normal size, you should probably give him a chance and try and treat him. So I think your answers are between, at the moment, B and C as the best answers. And the choice between those is very difficult. You can talk to the patients, but in the end, as soon as you start to say, I've got this one regime that might work really, really well, but it's going to give you lots of side effects. I've got the second regime. We don't know long-term data. Won't give you any side effects that might work. Almost no patient picks a regime where you've told them they've got lots of side effects. And I think in many centres now, we would have moved from B to C, 
with a caveat, we don't have long-term data. That's a cartoon that might put things into perspective. Non-nephrotic, very aggressive supportive therapy, very easy. Nephrotic with normal GFRs, aggressive supportive therapy, measure antibodies, wait between three and six months. If it's severe, you've got a choice. Tacrolimus, rituximab, and again, Ponticelli, I put question mark, there is data, but complication rate's high. But if the proteinuria is coming down, the antibody's falling, watch and wait. GFR falling, no CNI, one of those two. <coughs> proteinuria unchanged at six months, three choices really. If you presented with abnormal GFR, but more than 30, if your GFR is less than 30, no place for immunosuppression. If your GFR is more than 30 and you present nephrotic, supportive therapy, but you, can't, you haven't got an option of waiting and don't give a CNI, pick one of those two. I hope that's been a useful overview. I should remind you of this, that in the UK we can, or are about to be able to start to use rituximab much more widely for membranous because of this commissioning stuff. Megan, you've been involved in this. This is live. So actually we can now give almost free rituximab in membranous. I hope that's been a useful overview of membranous. It is not easy, but I think there is a clear way forward and watch the space for rituximab in the coming years.